Tonight's topic is a difficult one to talk about because we're going to, to lecture on the signs and symptoms of addiction. The problem with that uh, is that you are trying to determine whether or not you have an addiction which is itself invisible. So how do you know that something which is invisible, there is no way to have a direct observation of alcoholism or drug addiction itself. The only way that you can see that is indirectly through signs and through symptoms. So how do you know an addiction is present when you can't see it? Uh, what's it look like? Well, let's start this way. Well, you can tell those men are alcoholics, can't you? It's pretty obvious that they're alcoholics, right? That's Jack Lemon, by the way. Those other two guys, that's Jack Kerouac. They're alcoholics. You, you, you can tell, right? Obvious, right off the start. You say, no, you can't. <laughs> Wait a minute. Well, a actually, um, if we take a look at, in fact, the National survey of drug use and health for 2012, uh, what we find is, in fact, that alcoholics tend to be white, male, college educated, employed, northeastern, and that's what those guys look like. <laughs> if, you know, we have lots of myths and misconceptions uh, about the disease of addiction, uh, and the truth is, trying to see it is like, is like trying to look at the sun. Do you know the sun was out today? Sure. Did you look at it directly? No. Why? Well, you shouldn't, because it will burn your cornea. You don't, you don't want to look at the sun directly. It'll damage your, your retina. I'm sorry, your retina. Okay? But you know it's out, right? How do you know that? You didn't see it. And the answer is you know it because, not because you see it directly, but because it leaves signs uh, or we could say uh, symptoms. It's too bright to view directly, but you know it indirectly. You know it because you see glimpses of it, reflections from windows, or you felt the heat of the sun. And even though you didn't look at the sun, you could say, I am certain that it was out today. Would you bet money on it? Well, you should, shouldn't do that if you're a compulsive gambler, but would you bet money that the sun was out today? Yeah, you, was, would it be a safe bet? You're damn right it'd be a safe bet. But you didn't see it? No, you didn't see it. How are you so sure? And the answer is, you know it indirectly, not directly. Doctors and nurses are around here somewhere, but you haven't seen one, have you? And yet you're pretty sure that you're in a place where doctors and nurses practice uh, their trade. How do you know that? Well, you know it because you recognize that the name Shepherd Pratt is associated with hospital at this part. Y you see that, that little tiny building out there on Charles Street and you see the institutional look of all the buildings that are around the campus. And though you haven't seen a doctor or a nurse administer medicine or practice treatment, you know that somewhere around here, hospital is going on, right? And you know that for sure. And yet, you didn't see it. So how do you know that is alcoholism is around here? Well, the answer is... Uh, you know it because symptoms reveal its presence. Um, increased use of alcohol, a growing uh, tolerance for the drug, pattern of loss of control, blackouts, relief use, Jekyll Hyde reaction, emotional augmentation, continued use despite problems, impaired short term memory, impotence, clinical, the shakes, and other hallucinations. Yeah. The, the problem with anyone who is trying to determine 
whether or not he has an addiction based on the presence of symptoms, is that denial works in such a way that the viewer will look at the one symptom that hasn't happened to him or her. And so hallucinations in his head or her head become, you know, the, the sine qua non. If you don't have the hallucinations, then you don't have an addiction. And if you think that way, you'll say, well, next topic. I haven't had an hallucination, therefore I can't be uh, an addict. Uh, that's making a, a mistake that we call the all or nothing mistake. There are going to be 70 symptoms of addiction. It is typical for an addict to pick out the one that hasn't happened to him, and that becomes the big one. So don't do that. That's not wise thinking. You don't have to have all the symptoms of pneumonia to be diagnosed as having pneumonia, as a matter of fact. The other is a kind of a trick. It's a cause-effect switch. And the reasoning goes like this. Alcoholics wreck cars. Is that true? Yes, it is true. Not universal, but it is true. Watch this. I have never wrecked a car. You know what I'm going to conclude, don't you? That, therefore, I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> what I'm going to do is that I'm going to, this would only be true if it were to read all and only alcoholics wreck cars. I have never wrecked a car. Then I could reason that I couldn't possibly be an alcoholic because all and only alcoholics wreck cars. Uh, wrecking the car doesn't make you an alcoholic. Works the other way around. So if you, you've switched the cause and the effect. Wrecking the car doesn't cause you to turn into uh, an addict. It, it's that you're an addict which is causes you to wreck the car. All right? It works the other way around. Lots of times people will want to play that kind of game, and it's in the interest of, of denial. It's in the interest of that system of thinking that keeps an addict in the dark about his diagnosis. It's critical that he stay in the dark, but because if he sees the truth, then, oh my God, he'll have to do something about it. And if he doesn't want to do anything about it, he'll, he'll be bound to think, reason in any way that keeps him from thinking, my God, I have... I have alcoholism. So what we're going to do tonight is uh, what's called self-diagnosis. I have a friend named Jeff, and Jeff is a, a psychologist, and whenever I say self-diagnosis is the key to recovery, he says, don't say that. Only doctors are supposed to make a diagnosis of alcoholism. And I say to Jeff, Jeff, that's generally too, true, but the, the only key diagnosis is not the one a doctor makes, it's the one the patient makes. Why? Because it's based on what I call the axiom of recovery, which goes uh, something like this. Um, no one recovers from a disease he, had, he does not have. <laughs> if someone were to say to you, I have to solve my, gra my crabgrass problem this weekend, and he lives in downtown Baltimore, you'd say, you don't have grass, <laughs> much less crabgrass. You can't solve a problem until you have one. The axiom of recovery from addiction is this. The first step is self-diagnosis. I can make a diagnosis. I've been trained to do that. But my diagnosis doesn't matter one little bit if you don't make the diagnosis. Self-diagnosis is the first step to recovery. You've got to have the disease before you'll ever recover from it. The problem, however, is not only is the diagnosis critical, and, and it is critical. You have to make the diagnosis. Why? Because in the truest sense of the word, the diagnosis is critical. A addiction is a potentially fatal disease. So if you, don't make the, if you have it and you don't make the diagnosis, what you run the risk of is premature death. So 
Diagnosis is the first step. Why? Because this is a life-threatening disease. You damn sight better make the diagnosis or make some effort at the diagnosis uh, if, in fact, you have it. Because if you don't, you, you, you're playing, you know, the big league. Addiction, as far as I know, doesn't have a junior varsity version, you know. It's just a little bit <laughs> alcoholic. If you satisfy adult criteria, then you've got the disease. No matter whether you're 16 or 60, doesn't matter. And those, that diagnosis is based on pattern of loss of control, tolerance, and persistence in using despite problems. So, self-diagnosis is uh, critical. The other problem, damn it, is that it's also difficult. <laughs> Here's a disease that says, we'll pretend I'm it. It says, in order to recover from me, First, you're going to have to figure out whether or not you got me. And next is, I'm going to make it different, difficult for you to figure that out. I'm going to make it difficult for you to figure out whether or not you have this disease. So it requires self-diagnosis and then says, I'm going to screw it up because I'm going to make it hard for you to do that. Why? Well, there are a bunch of factors that are going to play a role in that. Uh, the first is that you're trying to diagnose whether or not you have an addiction. Unfortunately, you're using a brain that has been drugged and drug affected. So you figure out whether or not you've had a, a symptomatic experience. Unfortunately, you're going to have to do that using the brain that has blurred the experience to start with. Meanwhile, your experience what you think, you look pretty good at that party, right? Because that was being filtered through a drug. Everybody else saw you like, Ugh. you look like shit. But you thought you looked fine. And you're trying to interpret that experience through a, drug, a brain, through a brain that is drugged and drug affected. You recall incidents the next day uh, and again, it's being filtered through um, that same brain and that same experience. You tend to recall things that happened in a euphoric way, more pleasant way than they actually happened. Uh, and then, you know, you're trying to call, recall experience that you may have experienced in a blackout. So you can't remember it. You can't remember the experience. It's gone from your memory. And you can't interpret the meaning of an experience which you don't remember having had. <laughs> Crazy, right? We talk, I'm interviewing a lady in treatment, and I asked her the simple question, have you ever had a blackout? She said, no. And I believed her, and so I wrote, wrote down no blackouts. And, and um, the social worker interviewed her husband and said, has your wife ever had blackouts? And uh, the husband told the social worker, oh yeah, all the time now. And I said to the social worker, she has no memory of them. Okay. Um, well, we'd better ask the husband and wife to get together on this one so that we can figure out who's, us, who's telling us the truth. And they were both telling us the truth. It's just that one version, one's version of the truth was different from the other's version. In other words, she really believed she never had a blackout. I mean, he could recite incident after incident that she had blackouts. But she can't interpret th those experiences because she can't remember them. All right? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a damn silly disease. When I, when I used to hear it called a killer, I thought, oh, come on, that's, isn't that a little overstated? But then when you look at the factors that are involved in diagnosing it and why that's difficult, you, you do realize that, boy, this, this is a aim to kill you because, you know, it makes you sick, and while it's making you sick, it just tells you you're not sick. In addition to having a drugged brain, you have a denying mind. It's a denying mind that is trying to diagnose what the, the mind has denied. <laughs> That's crazy. So here's your mind trying to figure out 
whether or not you have a problem which you've de already denied you have. Whoa! <laughs> uh, in fact, the disease progresses only if it's denied. If you stop denying that you have alcoholism, it scares the shit out of you, and you say to yourself, I better do something about it. The reason you say, I, w you know, I don't have to do something about it is because I don't have it. My mind has succeeded in, in fooling me. The denial system that you have is not a, a t intended to fool any therapist, okay? Uh, the denial system, the target of that denial is the denier, is the one who's doing the denying. Uh, if he finds out that, oh my God, uh, I really have the problem, then he'll have to do something about it. And that something is abstinence, and he says, oh shit, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. So I worked with a youngster in high school. He was only a sophomore. And I said to him, I hate saying these things to kids especially, I said, I, I believe you are on the path to an addiction, uh, if not already there. So I, I said to him, I, I, I'm going to teach you something about denial. And I did. And I said, you know, I'll see you next week. So he came back the next week, and, and uh, he looked at me, and the first sentence out of his mouth, because he did study, he wanted to know. The first thing he said to me was, you know something about this denial system, Mr. Brody? And I said, what's that? And he said, when you got it, you don't know it. <laughs> I said, now you know what denial is, okay? That doesn't mean to fool you. That mean, doesn't mean to fool me. It means to fool you. Could kill you, couldn't it? A drug brain, a denying mind... And the denial takes many, many forms, you know? It's not just one simple, I don't think I have it. It takes many different forms. Uh, for instance, um, rationalizing. Uh, the only reason I had the accident is because the brakes on the Ford, the Ford brakes are to fault my, for my accident. Uh, we, we sort of quickly avoid the fact that your blood alcohol level at the time was a 0.20. <laughs> you, you blame Ford, Ford Company. At one patient, I thought, my God, I'm going to get a history of the Ford Motor Company. All in the interest of avoiding a process that's scary. That's scary. So I understand why it happens. It's a frightening process to, to go through. Extreme definitions. All alcoholics go to jail. I have never gone to jail. Therefore, I'm not an alcoholic. All alcoholics drink in the morning. I don't drink in the morning. Therefore, so if you make an extreme notion of addiction, especially one doesn't fit you, then you can opt out. You can uh, excuse yourself from the process. Because these things, and that's, you know, it's simply based on the notion that all alcoholics have every symptom in the textbook, and they don't. Uh, some alcoholics uh, uh, never drive a car, and so they don't have uh, uh, DWIs. Some alcoholics have never married, and so they don't have divorces because of it, you know. Kids haven't had time to have some experiences, but they've lost uh, girlfriends and boyfriends uh, and grades, their losses are different. So, no, you don't have to have every symptom. In fact, if you have all of them, uh, something wrong, because one of them is premature death. <laughs> Other people will know that, but unfortunately you won't. Normalizing. Um, everyone I know drinks the way I do. Well, if everyone you know drinks the way you do, then in your universe you've decided that it is normal to drink the way you do, right? And if that's normal, then your drinking cannot be abnormal. Because <laughs> something can't be normal and abnormal at the same time. So you've opted out. You've said, what I do with the drug is normal. 
And if it's normal, then you're, you fit into two-thirds of the population. Therefore, you couldn't possibly be an alcoholic. I had one patient say to me, Every person, everybody I know drinks the way I do. And I said, I know, you found them all. And years later, he said to me, you were right, you son of a gun. You were right, that was true, I did find them all. And so, in my universe, I ended up only drinking with people who drank alcoholically. All right? But normalizing can be a mechanism that helps you to believe that you're normal. Normal isn't a problem. Problems are abnormal. Ridiculing. In ridiculing what an addict who needs to deny his disease will do is make fun of anyone who thinks otherwise. So they'll say things like, oh, those AA people, they're just a bunch of God people. And I don't, I don't mess with the God people. All right? If you make fun of the disease and those people who are working uh, to recover from it, then you make the disease itself ridiculous. And if it's ridiculous, it's not real. Couldn't apply to you, certainly. Um, and so uh, this silly little thing you call a disease isn't a disease at all. It's just a, just a moral problem. People just drink too damn much. <laughs> you opt out, isn't it? You're working your way through this so that you don't have um, the disease. Defocusing is another one. Let's talk about your drinking. Okay, but first I want to talk about the food in the cafeteria. Uh-oh, here we go. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, it was the brakes on that Ford. Uh-oh. <laughs> Not only is that rationalizing, it's focusing someplace else. Let's talk about anything other than your your drinking and your drug use. Um, and so, the mind looks at the possibility that you have an addiction, and it scares you. And so you say, let's talk about the cafeteria food, let's talk about the situation of the Western world finds itself in, let's talk about the Baltimore riots, let's, got it? We'll talk about anything else that distracts me from the process of looking at potentially fatal disease and saying, I don't, I don't have it. I don't have it. Undoing, another popular defense mechanism. And, and uh, what you've got to understand is that alcoholics or drug addicts are not especially bad people. I mean, we, we always think, oh, these are real nasty, bad people. No. Jack Lemmon wasn't nasty or bad. and Ulysses Grant wasn't. Dick Van Dyke wasn't. Really. So not everybody who is alcoholic is, is nasty or bad because they're alcoholic. It's a primary disease. So all kinds of people get it. Baseball players and football players, and actors and actresses and senators and housewives and hobos. And you name it, the, 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 the spectrum of humanity end up with addiction. In undoing, what an addict will do is to say, by all my good acts, I undo or cancel out the bad act, which is drinking. So it starts with the premise that drinking too much is a bad thing for people to do, and I'm not bad. Uh, but I go to church, and I read the Bible, and I'm, I'm a Cub Scout leader, and so all these good things just cancel out my drinking and whatever my drinking's about. Called undoing. Well, you know, I'm a good person. My response to that is, sounds like you are a good person. But it also sounds like you're a good alcoholic person, too. It doesn't mean you're bad. It's a diagnosis of a disease, not a label of a character for a character. So, sure, you're good. Who said you weren't? You know, nobody thought you weren't. And minimizing, you know. Uh, well, how much you drink, have to drink Friday night? Oh, a little. Well, how much is a little? Well, not that much. What about giving me an amount? <laughs> All right. 
You mean number of bottles? Yeah, that'll do. <laughs> that'll do. So if you shrink it down, if you shrink down the drinking um, and the problems that result, that, that was just a fender bender. Well, it cost you $7,000 to repair the car. That's not called a fender bender, all right? But if you make it sound small, it's not big. And if it's not big, it's not a problem, right? Denial's tricky. It is really tricky. In fact, when people ask, what is it that uh, people do in treatment? Uh, the first part of the answer is we deal with the denial system. You walk in, I, I always joke that we've never admitted an alcoholic to Shepherd Pratt. Coming in, they were an alcoholic. We had one guy toast the building. It was a woman, actually. Uh, so we've never admitted one. We've discharged a bunch of them, <laughs> all right? In other words, after they come in for a while and they get some education and their denial system starts to erode, uh, they say, oh my God, I have alcoholism. So the first, the thing you do most of all is to, to attack, reduce, help to corrode. It's all, not all about yelling at your face. That's a silly notion. It's just putting the truth before your eyes that makes seeing it compelling, unavoidable. So, so a brain that's drugged, a mind in denial about a disease that's insidious. Uh, it's difficult to diagnose in the first place, even for people who have been trained to diagnose it have trouble teasing out real loss of control from accidental intoxication or from intentional intoxication. There are only three ways that I know of uh, to get uh, acutely intoxicated. One is accidental. Whoops. I didn't know how much would do what. Now, I will believe that if you're 14 years old. <laughs> After 14, <laughs> that's what we call in the field bullshit. Accidental, whoops. Yeah, you, when you're 13 or 12, you didn't know how much would do what. You drink a half a bottle of your mother's sherry and it was way too much, so you, uh, you vomited. That was accidental intoxication. That's not loss of control. The other is intentional. You, you can say to yourself, I am going to get shit-faced and mean it. And despite whatever gets in the way, you keep plunging on until you're thrown up, passing out. That's intentional intoxication. Unfortunately, sometimes it looks a lot like unintentional intoxication. Unintentional intoxication means that you didn't get that drunk, but you did, but you did get that drunk. Uh, how many times did you say to yourself, I think I'll drink till I vomit? Two. How many times did you actually drink till you vomited? Thirty-two. <laughs> then you have 30 instances of unintended intoxication to explain, because you only meant it twice, but it happened 32 times. How many times did you say, I think I'll drink till I pass out? Never. How many times did it happen? 12. Then you have 12 instances of unintended acute intoxication to explain. How do you explain that? Okay. Well, I'd explain it as loss of control. If it happens once, once doesn't mean a lot to me. If it happens as a pattern, then that starts meaning something to me. All right. You didn't intend it once, and it happened. Okay. You didn't intend it 12 times, and it happened 12 times. That catches my attention. We've got to have a name for that. Uh, with that pattern, we call it loss of control. It's even hard for a professional to distinguish heavy drinking 
from real tolerance. Real tolerance means that your brain resists the effect of the drug. That as a result, you can drink more and more and more and more of the drug without showing the appropriate effect. In other words, anyone who has six drinks in an hour ought to be showing some severe reaction uh, to alcohol. If you can drink six in an hour and not show that reaction, that's tolerance on one occasion. If you uh, get drunker than you meant to be, and that's happened regularly, that's unintended intoxication. If over time you've found that it takes more and more of the drug to produce the desired effect, that you have to keep upping the ante to get the desired, wee that's, uh, that, that's tolerance. That's what we call tolerance. So more drug to produce the effect, more drug to produce the effect, more drug, or same amount produces a reduced effect. You don't change the amount, but the effect shrinks. And then you walk into treatment and you say to someone like me in those days, uh, and then alcohol stopped working. Alcohol doesn't stop working. I mean, a, a measure of alcohol, uh, alcohol is measured in your bloodstream by how much blood and how much alcohol you poured in it. And that should be consistent. If you have 10 pints of blood and you pour four beers in that, you should produce a blood alcohol level no matter whether you experience it or not. So the drug always, quote, works. In other words, it will produce an alcohol level. Um, you're not experiencing it at that level means that you're becoming increasingly tolerant. And guess what? Tolerance all by itself is a problem. Right? Kids would say to me, I, w I worked with kids at one point in my career. Kids would say to me, uh, I'm lucky. I can hold a lot. <laughs> my response is, no, you're not. <laughs> that's not good luck. That's bad luck. It just means that you can, you know, you kill more brain cells than your friends. So you're just getting dumber quicker. <laughs> that's all. Tolerance isn't good luck. Now, all by itself, tolerance isn't the diagnosis. Uh, this isn't diagnosed by any single phenomenon. It takes patterns of these phenomena, loss of control, tolerance, persistence. It takes patterns, not one instance of. It's sneaky because um, for some, uh, addiction appears almost from the very beginning, and for others it appears so gradually that you can't tell it was happening. Uh, there, are, there are people we refer to as instant addicts or instant alcoholics. And it doesn't mean that um, the first time they drank, they were diagnosable. They had fit the loss of control, tolerance, persistence pattern. Uh, what it does mean is that they were symptomatic from the start, right? So the first time you drank, you had a blackout. Wow, that's a symptom. Uh, early on, you had a high tolerance. You may have started with a high tolerance, okay? Uh, early on, yours was a Jekyll Hyde reaction to the drug. You drank it and turned into Mr. Hyde, wanting to hurt people, kill people. So you're symptomatic from the very get-go. So for you, that's seen as not abnormal because it's always been the way. And if something has always been the way from the very start, we think that that's like everybody, right? That's normal. So people who are instant addicts uh, believe that um, everyone re reacts that way. And so they couldn't be abnormal. It couldn't be a, an unusual phenomenon. The other way that it progresses is very gradually. And so it's kind of like aging. You don't know from one day to the next that you've aged, right? You don't walk into the bathroom, look in the mirror and say, oh my God, I got another gray hair. That happens very, very gradually over time. And then one day you pick up a, a, a photo album and you see pictures of people who look vaguely familiar. And you ask, who's that? <laughs> and someone who's, been, who's known you for a while said, that's you. 
20 years ago. So what, when shit that happen? <laughs> you know, when did I get old? It really sneaked up on me, didn't it? It really sneaked up on me. I, I don't remember. I mean, I go in the bathroom in the morning and I think, who is the old bastard in that mirror? I said, it can't be me, all right? This is a disease that's just as sneaky as that. Either you've had it from the start or it happened so gradually you didn't see it happen. Societal and cultural messages are ambiguous. The lines between social use, abuse, and addiction are muddled. Many people have no idea of where you draw the line. They think heavy drinking is alcoholism. It's not alcoholism. It's got to be more of a pattern of something else. They think, some people think that any use is already abuse. So if you smoke marijuana, that means you've already abused a drug. They don't think there's any difference between use and abuse. To use an illegal drug is to abuse. Unfortunately, if you think that way, you just eliminated the possibility of use of a drug, right? Just thrown it out. Use it is to abuse it. And uh, how many of you know, uh, God, this is anathema. How many of you know a social marijuana user? Want to see a show of hands? Oh my God, you, you've known some of those people. Huh? Don't, I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But I'll tell you what, <laughs> if we all only tell you bullshit, we're not going to help you terribly much. So that's difficult. Alcoholics do drink alcoholically in social situations. All right? In other words, the situation is social, uh, but their use of the drug during in that situation isn't social. It exhibits the patterns of loss of control, tolerance, and persistence, or harm results as a result of use. So uh, it's a social situation, but you were drinking either abusively or addictively in that situation. Sure, people were around, okay? But the party you were having was more in your head than anywhere else. Using a drug is not abusing a drug. Abuse is harmful use. When use causes trouble, problems, harm, then it's abuse. So just to use a drug is not to abuse a drug. That destroys the meaning of the word use, okay? Addiction does not require physical dependence. And yet that's another one that most of us have locked in our heads. That the way you determine whether or not someone has a drug addiction, that will include alcohol addiction, is when they get the shakes. All right? Unfortunately, they're not the same. Addiction is one thing. Physical dependence is another thing. Sometimes they exist apart. Sometimes they exist together. But they don't always work together. So some people can be addicted but not dependent. There is, some people can de be dependent but not addicted. And some people are both. They're both addicted and dependent. Physical dependence is not required as part of the diagnosis. In fact, there's many an addict who has not reached the point of physical dependence, but whose patterns of loss of control, tolerance, and persistence make clear that they have a serious problem. We call that problem addiction. So don't wait around till you're physically dependent. Hell, it might be too late at that point. We think everybody drinks a whole lot. We think Americans drink a whole lot. But here are some statistics. These are statistics uh, as recent as April of 2014. The World Health Organization took a look of people 15 and older for a period of six years. Uh, and out of 188 countries, there is their ranking. Now, you notice America ain't there. So where is it? Where do you suppose it is? How many of you think it's probably number five or lower? Between five and ten? Somewhere between five and ten. Well, unfortunately, 
Here's what the World Health Organization found. That we're 57. Now you might say, well, the World Health Organization doesn't know what it's doing. Really? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> So we're not number one, unfortunately. There's some other countries that, that beat us, okay? Um, some of those countries, as a matter of fact, don't have a, a high percentage of alcoholics. For instance, we, we can show you uh, statistics on Portugal, which shows that they drink two and a half times as much as the Icelanders do, but have only a, a minimal need uh, for AA. So they drink a lot, but they don't get the disease a lot. The average American, 18 years of age or older, according to the National Institute of Health, the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, uh, found that uh, for 18 and older, 87.6% uh, reported they drank alcohol at some point in their lifetime that 71% reported that they drank in the past year, and that 56.3% reported that they drank in the past month. Now, that becomes more understandable when you look at it in terms of who didn't. 86.7% drank at some point in their lifetime. You know what that also means is that 13% have never taken a drink in their lifetime. That the 71% who said they used it last year leaves you with what, 29%? Who didn't drink last year. So we're not number one. And of course the 56% who said they didn't drink last, mo not last month leaves quite a percentage, right? Who didn't drink last month. If we look at the percentage of binge drinkers and heavy drinkers, okay, uh, binge drinking is reported as um, in the past month, five or more alcoholic drinks on the same occasion at least one day in the past 30 days. So if you had more than five drinks one day, in the last 30 days, you were called a, um, a binge drinker. Well, of course, you know what that also means is that 76% did not binge drink last month. So one out of four, di one out of four did, three out of four didn't. 7.1% uh, reported heavy drinking in the past month. Heavy drinking was defined as five or more alcoholic drinks on the same occasion on each of five or more days the past 30 days. So it's, it's binge drinking if there's one, one day of five drinks in the last 30. Now it's heavy drinking, it's five of those occasions. Of course you know what that means too, don't you? That 93% were not heavy drinkers last month. So if you're saying I'm a heavy drinker, five or more drinks on an occasion, or I'm a binge drinker, uh, you're not in the majority. You're in the minority. Americans don't drink as much as we think. Um, and media, in fact, then uh, presents uh, alcoholism, alcoholics and drug addicts, uh, as funny. And if you can't, you can't be laughing at alcoholism and take it seriously at the same time, right? I mean, that, that's a contradiction. It can't be both. It can't be serious and funny at the same time. And yet, is that the way America, American media presents addiction? It sure does. You recognize those folks? Come on, you guys are old enough. I, I know you've seen these guys on television. Reverend Jim, taxi. Reverend Jim presents us with a case of alcoholism and advanced organic brain syndrome, which means that Jim is brain damaged. Okay? He's brain damaged. 
isn't he funny? Well, wait a minute. I didn't think brain damage was funny. I thought brain damage was serious. Jim made us laugh, didn't he? He made us laugh. Now, there's a reason that you can laugh at Jim. The reason is that Jim is presented as a cartoon character. In other words, he's not a real human when you see him. He's two-dimensional. Human beings are three-dimensional. So he's presented to us as, you know, flat, not fully human. Okay? And Karen, you recognize Karen. Uh, she's, a, um, she's a constant drinker, isn't she? I have yet to see Karen on the show without a drink in her hand. She's diagnosable, for God's sake. And we laugh at both of them because they're presented to us in a flat sort of way. Uh, there was a comedian whose name was Foster Brooks. How many of you have ever heard of Foster Brooks? How many old bastards I know can remember him? Uh, if you haven't ever seen Foster Brooks, Google Foster Brooks and watch one of his bits. He does an imitation of intoxication that is astonishing. Whenever I've seen it, I thought, how does he know? <laughs> how does he know? He must know an alcoholic. One night on the show, he was doing this imitation of a drunk, and he slipped into talking about the impact his drinking had had on him and the impact his drinking had had on his family and the impact his denial had on him. And an audience that had been howling moments ago stopped laughing. The place got deadly silent. Because what he did was shift from the two-dimensional cartoon, Walt Disney, Foster Brooks, to the fully human Foster Brooks. Now it's not funny. It's not funny anymore. So there's a reason that such characters are, are capable of evoking laughter, and it's simply because we don't really think of them as um, real human beings. So you got a brain that's drugged, a mind in denial about a disease that's hard to figure out in the first place, and a culture that makes it really screwed up, and then fear and pride uh, play a role, making uh, admitting and accepting alcoholism distressing. It means a life of abstinence. And if it means a life of abstinence, you don't want uh, to acknowledge that you have such a disease. Now, who wants to be an alcoholic? Can I have a show of hands? Oh, gee, I want to be one. Shit, I, I hope I grow up to be one. <laughs> Nobody wants to, all right? So pride blocks it. The other is fear blocks it. If you got the disease, you have to abstain. Ah, shit. Never mind, I don't have it. So I'd rather believe that I don't have it than to believe that I have it and I'm going to drink anyway. Because no one wants to think of themselves as intentionally suicidal. And then addicts manipulate language. An alcoholic will admit that he has a big desire, but not a craving, okay? Craving sounds bad. Big desire is okay, okay? Um, hangover doesn't count, so he answers no when he's asked if he has been unable to work because of drinking. No, I wasn't drinking that morning. I had a hangover, but that doesn't count. Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. It means you couldn't make work because of your drinking. Uh, years ago, uh, Dr. Robert Seliger at Hopkins University, Hopkins, in fact, um, Department of Psychiatry, uh, created a list of 20 questions. Hopkins has since sort of disowned the 20 questions, but AA is still using them because they said to themselves, well, this guy Seliger came up with 20 questions that we think are telling, and so that if you answer three or more out of uh, the 20 is yes, you got the problem. Uh, unfortunately, alcoholics will skew the questions so they don't lose time from work due to drinking. They think that in order to say yes, you'd have to be drunk that morning. Hungover didn't count. Uh, is, uh, do you drink because you are shy with other people? Uh, yeah, so what? 
have you gotten into financial difficulty as a result of drinking? Uh, just, a, just a little bit. And of course, when we find out the actual amount, we're talking about tens of thousands. So in order to diagnose this, you gotta, you got to get these things going to you. You've got to be as honest as you're capable of being. Now, notice I didn't say completely honest. Why? Because once you know something about denial, an addict, when he says, no, I don't have a problem, is not lying in the traditional sense of that word. In order to lie, you have to know the truth. His denial suggests that he doesn't know the truth. He has a version of the truth that he believes. Okay? Uh, denial um, is not the uh, result of stupidity. There are some very smart people uh, who have this denial system. And it works because it fools them. And I have, I've been asked often, is there a difference between smart alcoholic and a dumb one? I say, yeah. Uh, the, sm the smart ones stay sicker longer because their denial is trickier, more complex, more complicated than the others. You've got to be honest, as honest as you're capable of being. If you have trouble being honest, ask people who have witnessed your drinking and drug use. And be willing to listen to the answer. You know, if you say to them, I want you to tell me about my drinking, you make it very clear that if they do, you're going to bite them right in the face. All right? So you've got you've to open yourself up to feedback and not threaten people with your reaction when you ask, you know, tell me about my, my drinking. You've got to be willing. You've got to be willing for no other person but yourself and for no other reason but that knowing the answer is vital. This is a vital question, which means it's a life and death question. So you've got to be willing for you, not as a favor to your wife, your husband, the judge, your youngest daughter, your son, it's not for them. You've got to figure this one out for yourself because this is a vital life or death question. Um, some people may get started uh, because the judge wants them to be willing, but they turn that corner when they say, no, this is not about the judge either. This is about whether or not I have a potential life-threatening disease. So you've got to do for that, for only yourself and for only that reason. And you've got to be dry. I don't know how you can possibly conclude that you have a drug problem while you're using drugs. Because if you're using drugs, you've already decided that you don't have a problem, or else you wouldn't be using them. So it's impossible, in fact, logical impossibility to use a drug and claim you have no, and at the same time have no problem with it, if in fact there has been evidence that you do have a problem. So you've got to get dry. I worked in a, um, a, a low-bottom place at one point, and there's this guy who came to me after a lecture that I'd given. He said, um, look, I, I, only have, I only have one problem, and that is that when, I'm, when, I'm, when I drink on the weekend, I have trouble getting to work on Monday. Uh, what do you suggest that I do? And I said, oh, hell, that's easy. He said, well, what is it? And I said, well, don't drink on the weekend. If you don't drink on the weekend, I'll bet you a dollar to a donut, you'll get to work Monday. Or if you don't, we'll know why. Okay? So stop drinking. He said, uh, you mean stop? Of course, with tongue in cheek, I said, yep. Everything? Yep. Even beer? Yep. I only have a problem once in a while on Monday. And we laugh at that. But you know what motivates that, that switch is, oh shit, this is scary. That the answer to my question is stop drinking, and I don't want to do that. So, you got to be dry. Now, I don't mean this. Please don't make this mistake. If you are uh, bipolar, manic depressive illness, uh, you should never stop your medication 
without consulting with um, a psychiatrist who knows the risk you would take. So consult some psychiatrist who knows what it means to stop taking bipolar medication because most of them are not addictive substances. You'd be in real trouble if you stopped them. If you're a schizophrenic, it does not mean stopping your Haldol. Uh, if you stop your Haldol, you'll get, you'll get crazy. Uh, you'll lose control. So uh, other than that, and if you have a question about a medication, then you consult with a physician who understands, a psychiatrist who understands addiction about whether or not you should stop that drug. Other than that, if you're using recreational drugs and you're sure you won't have um, a severe withdrawal, if you think you might have a withdrawal uh, from a benzo, for instance, benzodiazepines, Valium Librium, uh, etc., they are potentially addictive substances. And you become physically dependent on them. And you can have a seizure if you stop them abruptly. Uh, you should consult with someone who knows detoxification uh, and not stop a drug all on your own. You need to consult with people who understand. So, um, with that, we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll, start, we'll talk about five categories of symptoms, uh, and then we'll go through each category. And so, take a break, and I'll see you back here in 10 minutes. <laughs>